Good morning. Every year since 2001, MIT Technology Review has published a list of the 10 technologies that are clearly the big breakthroughs of this year. Innovations that are a clear advance in their field. This list will help our readers understand which technologies are likely to have the biggest impact on businesses and society. To create it, we solicit guidance and input from experts around the world, from companies, investment firms, and research labs. So, well, what do we like? Well, we're very cross-disciplinary in our thinking. We enjoy tracing how developments in one field can lead to advances in another. So, for example, a breakthrough in artificial intelligence from our 2013 issue has become crucial to the ambitions of self-driving cars from our 2016 issue. We also applaud ambitious solutions, such as Google's plan to bring access to the world. And we admire elegance and power. And we were blown away when scientists used CRISPR to engineer two macaw monkeys demonstrating the vast potential of gene editing as listed in our 2014 edition. So a reasonable question is, how have our predictions fared? Over the years, we've identified many technologies that have flourished and gone on to be part of our everyday lives. But we've sometimes got it wrong or sometimes we've just been too early. In 2009, we found a smart personal assistant inside SRI, the Silicon Research Valley giant, which astonished us by its naturalness. And that became Siri when Steve Jobs to, uh, purchased it for the Apple iPhone. Today, smart assistants are ubiquitous. And our devices have made the leap into the home with Amazon Echo and Google Home and others. Here's something we got wrong. Social TV was a 2010 breakthrough technology that we talked about. We thought that somehow social media and broadcast TV would merge, but they remain obstinately separate streams that people can experience simultaneously tweeting their impressions about presidential debates as they watch them on TV. Let's take a look at this year's list for a quick overview, and then we're going to examine each one. Our first breakthrough, reversing paralysis, scientists are making remarkable progress at using brain implants to restore the freedom of movement that spinal cord injuries take away. Wireless brain-body electronic interfaces to bypass damage to the nervous system. It's a system that reads the subject's intention, in this case a monkey, to move forward and then transmit it immediately in the form of bursts of electrical stimulation to its spine. This year I wrote about a, a really amazing emerging technology which could help uh, restore motion to paralyzed people. It goes by different names. One of them is a neural bypass and it's, uh, it's pretty incredible stuff. <laughs> may have heard there's experiments where people get a probe put in their brain, uh, reads their thoughts, and they can control a robot arm or maybe a cursor on a computer screen. But what's happening now is that scientists are connecting uh, that brain probe to electrodes in people's arms or legs and allowing them to move their limbs again using their thoughts. These injuries are just devastating. And so anything that can be done to help people uh, restore even simple motions, like raising your hand to your mouth to grab a 
a cup of water uh, would make a huge difference. And although the results are dramatic, the experiments are super interesting, it's quite hard to bring it all together in a system that would actually be useful in the real world. So I'm saying it's still 10 or 15 years away. Our key players here, Eco Polytechnic, Pittsburgh, Case Western, to name a few. And it matters because thousands of people are suffering paralyzing injuries every year. As Antonio pointed out, the availability of this probably 10 to 15 years. Our next breakthrough, long haul trucks that drive themselves for extended stretches on highways. Tractor trailers without a human at the wheel will soon barrel its way onto highways near you. What will this mean for America's 1.7 million truck drivers, as one example? Well, at first glance, the opportunities and challenges posed by self-driving trucks might seem to merely echo those of self-driving cars. But the economic rationale for self-driving trucks might be much stronger than just for driverless cars. Autonomous trucks can coordinate their movements to platoon closely together over long stretches of highway, cutting down on drag and then saving on, on fuel. And letting the truck drive itself a part of the way will figure to help the trucker complete its route sooner. Right now, we see a lot of interest in self-driving cars. Uh, we see, of course, Google has its self-driving cars and Uber is really very interested in getting into that market. But really, I think where most of the action is going to be is in trucks. This can really raise the productivity of truck driving tremendously because right now truck drivers are limited to driving 11 hours a day or 60 hours a week. Uh, with self-driving trucks, they're gonna be able to roll 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now in an age of online shopping, uh, this could impact every single component of the economy. Over the long term, there's really no reason to believe why self-driving trucks couldn't get going without drivers. And then you're talking about replacement of millions and millions of humans. So there could be a lot of people up in arms about this. Our key players here, Otto, Volvo, Daimler, Peter Bilt. It matters because there are millions of truck drivers all over the world, and the technology might free them to complete routes more efficiently, but it could also erode their pay and eventually replace many of them. There are about 4% people in the world that actually earn their living driving, and truck driving is actually one of the last jobs in the States where someone with a high school education can earn six figures a year. Our next breakthrough, paying with your face, face recognition technology that is finally accurate enough to be widely used in financial transactions and other everyday applications. Face detecting systems in China now authorize payments, provide access to facilities, and are cracking down on criminals. Face++ Plus Plus is a Chinese startup that is valued around $1 billion. It pinpoints 83 points on a face, and the distance between those points is, uh, provides the means of identification. So in China, face recognition is already available and it's pretty widespread. Uh, there, are, there are apps where you can use your face to log in, there are stores you can go into and pay for things using just your face. So this technology has, uh, in recent years, become so accurate that it's possible to recognize people even in sort of grainy CCTV footage from a funny angle with, with odd lighting. You know, a couple of years ago, that would have been inconceivable. It just wasn't possible. But uh, new machine learning techniques have made it possible for computers to recognize people's faces even more accurately than a person can. The big obstacle here, obviously, is the big brother element. You know, when I saw this stuff in China, I thought it was really impressive, really, you know, going to have a big impact. But it's also a little bit creepy, a little bit kind of dystopian. So if, if it's going to come to Europe, come to the US in the same sort of level, I think that they're going to have to be some sort of trade-off and people are going to have to see the convenience is so great that it, they're willing to give up a little bit more of their privacy. Our key players here, Face++, Plus Plus, Baidu and Alibaba. And 
The technology offers a secure and extremely convenient method of payments, but of course it could also raise privacy concerns. The availability is now. The fabrication of stable qubits, the basic unit of quantum computers, advances at Google, Intel, and several other research groups indicate that computers with previously unimaginable powers are now finally within reach. Quantum computing, when it's ready, will really change how we think about computation. It will change encryption. It will change how we plan delivery and logistics that involve complex scheduling. Every year, it seems like quantum computing comes up as a candidate for our list of top 10 technologies. This year, it finally made it because finally, we think that quantum computing is becoming practical or near practical, and it's getting the investments from companies like Google and Microsoft and Intel to finally make it into the real world. Within five years, we'll begin to see real quantum computers out there. Our key players here, Microsoft, Google, you all know these brands. And it matters because quantum computers could exponentially run much faster at running artificial intelligence programs, doing complex simulations and cryptography. So, Indeed, there are whole classes of quite ordinary human problems that could only be solved by quantum computers. We anticipate the availability around four to five years. Consumer cameras that produce 360-degree images provide a realistic sense of events or places. These are inexpensive cameras that provide spherical images, and they're opening a new era of photography and changing the way people share stories. I read about 360-degree cameras. Um, specifically, these are 360-degree cameras that are small enough to fit in your pocket, generally priced under $500, and are easy to use. It's only been in the past year or so, however, that the big players have jumped in. So Samsung and Nikon have models that came out last year. And then we also saw Facebook and Google uh, support not just uh, recorded 360 degree videos, but live streaming of 360 degree videos. Big events these days, it is actually happening in spherical imaging. The New York Times covered inauguration day uh, using 360 degree images. I think it opens a new era in photography and in the way people tell stories. Our key players here, 360 Fly, JK Imaging, Kodak Pix Pro. Availability is now, and it matters because photos and vid videos with this perspective could essentially become the new standard for anything from news coverage to vacation shots. Our next breakthrough is a solar power device that could theoretically double the efficiency of conventional solar cells. So by converting heat to focused beams of light, a new solar device could create cheap and continuous power. Decades later, these slabs of silicon are still bulky, expensive, and inefficient. And also, standard silicon solar cells mainly capture the visual light from violet to red. So that and other factors mean that we can never turn around more than 32% of the energy of the sunlight into energy. But a team of MIT scientists has built a different solar uh, energy device that uses inventive engineering and advances in material science to capture far more of the sun's energy. What these researchers at MIT have done is created a photonic crystal. What this crystal does is it captures more energy from the sun. It captures it as heat energy, which in today's solar cells is lost. This heat is converted inside the crystal into wavelengths of light that a solar cell can process. So what you could imagine is solar power that is more efficient, and can run for more hours of the day, and in fact, can continue to produce some electricity even after the sun goes down. 
our key players here, uh, MIT and uh, Purdue University. It matters because this new design could lead to inexpensive solar power that keeps working after the sun is setting. Uh, availability quite far into the future still, 10 to 15 years. Gene therapy 2.0. The first gene therapies have actually just recently been approved, actually in uh, August of 2017. But more are on the way, and scientists have solved fundamental problems that were holding back cures for rare hereditary disorders. Next, we'll see if the same approach can take on cancer, heart disease, and other common illnesses. Researchers have been chasing the dream of gene therapy for decades now, and the idea is elegant, which is to use an engineered virus to de deliver healthy copies of a gene into a patient with defective ones. But until recently, it actually produced more disappointments than successes, and the entire field was slowed down in 1999 when an 18-year-old patient actually with a liver disease died in a gene therapy experiment. Gene therapy is the idea of taking an engineered virus and using it to deliver a corrected version of a gene to a patient's cells that have a defective or mutated version of that gene. In 2016, we saw patients with hemophilia as well as certain forms of inherited blindness being treated successfully with these gene therapies and now as some companies are getting ready to submit applications to the Food and Drug Administration, we're likely to see some of these therapies approved in the next couple of years. Scientists are also exploring the use of gene therapy for more common diseases like heart failure, Parkinson's disease, as well as cancer. The scientists have learned a lot more about how these therapies work, how they can be delivered more effectively. So really we're seeing the next wave of these therapies sort of come to fruition. Our key players here, Biomarin, Bluebird Bio, Unicure, to name a few. Thousands of diseases stem from an error in a single gene, and new treatments could cure them. And this availability is right now. Imagine a master catalog of every cell type in the human body. Biology's next mega project will find out what we're really made of. The scientists are building an ultra-detailed human cell atlas that defines living cells by what goes on inside them. We wrote about something called the cell atlas. Uh, it's an effort to catalog all the different types of cells in the human body uh, using the latest techniques in genomics and microfluidics. It's pretty cool stuff. But the study of cells has really relied on what they look like. Neurons are long and hairy, cancer cells are strange and, uh, and creepy looking. Uh, each cell has its sort of morphology and that's the way people have categorized them. But uh, new techniques allow scientists to look into each cell um, and see the molecules that are active in it. Clearly, we want to know what we're made of. If you intend to treat cancer, schizophrenia, or understand any disease, you've got to know what the cells are. This technology is actually a kind of successor to the Human Genome Project. Now there's the Cell Atlas Project. It's just getting off the ground maybe this year. Um, when will a complete Cell Atlas be available? Hard to say. Probably take a few years. Our key players here, the Broad Institute, Chan Zuckerberg Biohab, and the Zanger Institute. Well, super accurate models of human physiology will speed up the discovery and test of new drugs. We're anticipating the availability around five years. Malware that takes control of webcams, video recorders, and other consumer devices to cause widespread internet outages. Botnets have existed for well over a decade. And thanks to a flood of cheap gadgets from the Internet of Things, the problem of cyber attacks has only become worse. 
A year ago, a botnet made up of about 100,000 comprised gadgets knocked an internet infrastructure provider partially offline, creating an absolute catastrophe. So let's hear what our editor at large, Brian Bergstein, has to say about this. This year, we're highlighting as one of the 10 most important technologies to watch, botnets made out of devices on the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is all kinds of devices that are thought of as maybe smart home devices. You have webcams and security systems and smart refrigerators, but there's something not very smart about them, which is that security is not their priority, connectivity is. And hackers are taking very clever advantage of the low levels of security in some of these web-connected devices to assemble botnets that are extremely large and thus extremely powerful. Last year, we saw a milestone, unfortunately, in this effort, where a botnet made out of Internet of Things devices brought down a single internet infrastructure provider that's based in New Hampshire. Taking down this one provider brought sites offline for many people across the country, huge sites such as Netflix, Reddit, and Twitter. And we think this is just the beginning. In fact, the botnet that was used in the attack last fall was known as Mirai, which is Japanese for the future. So who are key players here? Well, whoever created the Mirai botnet, and perhaps people like us, anyone who runs purely secured online devices. Botnets based on this software are disrupting larger and larger swaths of the internet, and they're getting harder to stop. Our final breakthrough is reinforcement learning. It's an approach to artificial intelligence that gets computers to learn like people without explicit instruction. Our editor, Will Knight, gives us a great sound bite on this. So my story is about reinforcement learning, which is actually a reasonably old idea in uh, machine learning that has emerged recently as a way to give computers incredible new capabilities. <laughs> Instead of giving it any instructions or giving it any examples, you just let the machine go and figure out for itself how to achieve its task. And, and sometimes it can come up with things that no person could ever program into it. So with AlphaGo, you know, it was not possible to design and to program a computer to play Go to a superhuman level. But through reinforcement learning, a machine was able to just figure that out for itself with experimentation. It's become much more powerful in the last couple of years by combining it with something called deep learning, which is uh, using a huge um, neural network to perform the, the learning that a computer does. So people are applying it to robotics, um, to self-driving cars, and by combining those two things together, you're going to see, see it applied a lot more places in coming years. Our key players in this space, Uber, Google, DeepMind, OpenAI, well, one example of why it matters is progress in self-driving cars and other forms of automation will slow dramatically unless machines can hone skills through experience. Our availability, we're anticipating one to two years. But why does anything of this matter? New technologies solve big problems and expand human possibilities. But technology is not an absolute good. And it's important that we talk about it and that we understand how we want to use technologies as a society and not be used by them. For more in-depth knowledge of our 10 breakthrough technologies, please visit technologyreview.com. And you can also find access to our other special features, such as our 50 smartest companies and our innovators under 35. Thank you.